Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Welcome to the University of Maryland in CVS Research Forum. Uh, I'm um, Min Shea. I'm a professor at the University of Maryland, the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice. And my co-host, who is also a moderator for this session, Dr. Jim Lynch, who is also a professor in the same department. Um, and uh, uh, welcome to today's uh, research forum. Um, before we start the meeting, I would like to um, provide some notes for today's session. The, uh, we encourage participants to use chat to submit your questions. And even though there are many ways to ask questions um, on Zoom, we, because we have a lot of people here, it's the easiest if you write down your questions and uh, submit through chat, then my uh, research assistant, who's a doctoral student at the University of Maryland Daily, who will help us compile all the questions um, so we can get to those questions later. Um, and then the PowerPoint slides and also a recording of the session today will be posted later. And uh, so you can uh, review the materials after um, that, after we conclude all three sessions for the research forum. And uh, I wanted to briefly talk about today's agenda. Um, so Jim and I will provide some opening remarks um, this is to help you understand the goal for today's um, session. And after that, we will um, introduce the panel so you will get a, a chance to meet the panelists. Um, and then we have compiled questions for today's discussion. And we'll have two sections for the discussion. The first one is um, ask the panelists to provide individual remarks. So we'll go around the, the group. Um, each of them will have like, two minutes to um, address each question. And then after that, we will um, have a group discussion, which is free format, meaning that we uh, invite panelists to um, share their opinions and comment on each person's suggestions, which should be fun that we can see how they interact with one another. And then after that, we'll have uh, an Q&A session, and then the panelists um, and also the moderators um, can provide some closing remarks for, um, for the uh, today's session. All right, so again, welcome to today's uh, session. Um, as you are aware, we have designed three sessions for the NCVS Research Forum. Um, the goal is to increase the use of NCVS data for research and analytical purposes. And today's session is this round table discussion, uh, which we hope that um, to invite these um, uh, well-known, world-known scholars to the session, which will inspire researchers to see the advantages of the NCVS and how the data might be used to help you address problems of crime and victimization, right? We hope the discussion will provide you with some ideas of how you might use the survey and ideas of how you can, um, you know, use related data and um, theory to further your research agenda. So that's what we're trying to accomplish today. And then we have session two, which is tomorrow, um, which will uh, focus on specific examples of uh, research that have been conducted by BJS um, statisticians and also external researchers. Um, and these are re examples of research that showing the creative use of the NCVS. So that will be a um, very uh, um, interesting discussion. And then next week, session three, which is on May 4th, by the way, that's a very important day for Star Wars fans. We'll have a hands-on workshop showing you how to uh, use the NCVS data, how to manipulate the files and how to use weights and so on. And that could be very important for young scholars who are trying to learn how to use um, the NCVS. So three sessions, and uh, I hope you will be able to participate in all of them. And then uh, we also have recordings um, that you can use afterwards. 
And so now, Jim, I, uh, Jim, could you provide some uh, very brief note about what NCVS is and also people on this panel? Thank you. Uh, I, I want to start by saying that the, um, you know, that this grew out of a conversation that Mean and I are having about why aren't students using the NCVS more? And so there's, it's, uh, it's, uh, and we determined that it's, they just couldn't get their arms around the elephant. And so part of the logic behind these three sessions is, the, is to give people a way to relate to this massive amount of data that's sitting there year after year after year. And I'm astounded why people just aren't all over it. And so let's hope that we can give them some kind of foothold that they can begin to explore uh, this database the way you all have. So I think that, uh, let me say something about the NCBS. I think that there may be people online who don't know anything about it. That's the longest running continuous uh, victimization survey in the world. I, uh, there, I think there's some guy in Finland named, named Aroma who says, who claims that thing, but I don't think he's right. Uh, but at any rate, it is, it is uh, uh, unique in that regard. And uh, I think it, uh, it has, as a, its focus, it, it started out looking at uh, street crimes, basically, like the, the index crimes and the FBI collects data on plus assault. So that was the that was the scope of it. But it's it's grown significantly, especially in the recent past, to include other kinds of crime like hate crime and stalking, which you'll see later on in the in the presentation. So that um, it has really expanded uh, uh, with with the times, and I think that that. Uh, that's another advantage of this particular survey. And so it's organized in a way where you uh, have a screening interview where you ask uh, respondents about their, to report on their crime experience in the last six months. And then that's followed up by an incident form, which collects a lot of detailed information about that event and how people responded to that event. Um, so it's a, a, a rotating panel design so that People are admitted into the sample for uh, three and a half years, and they're asked about their victimization experience at, in six months intervals. So uh, this gives the survey some very unique aspects. That is to say that it, it, uh, it gives you some long, it's not a perfect longitudinal file, but it gives you some longitudinal, some longitudinal data. Uh, and it has, um, it interviews everybody in the household, 12 12 years of, old, of age and older. And so um, that uh, you have uh, the unique feature of having more than one person per household, which is, is uh, a, a, tremendous, a tremendous advantage, I think. And so, so that's the basic uh, sort of organization of the survey. And I think that, uh, that um, uh, and some of the unique features of the survey that make it useful for research purposes. And so I think that uh, the data are available generally at, from BJS in the form of reports uh, and spreadsheets, but also they have the data sets are available. Some of these data sets which have, have uh, considerably to the, to the base data by linking it over time, by taking the, the micro data and the, the Janet uh, and uh, has done with uh, uh, over a long time series to, to look at narratives the way Lynn Addington has uh, to add context to the data. So all of these kinds of, of um, unique features are available in some of the data sets at ICPSR uh, and, uh, and from BJS website itself. So I think that much, this will be explained in much greater detail in the, in the, third, uh, in the third session of this forum. So I think that in this particular session, I'm so thrilled that uh, nobody said no. <laughs> and, you know, this is, this is an assemblage of the people that I respect most in terms of how they have, have used these data. You know, in some cases, they've used, they've used the data to look at uh, criminal victimization and risk and, uh, for um, unique types of crime. And I think uh, so... Um, but uh, so repeat victimization, Mahi Tessaboni has done a, a tremendous amount as well as other folks have, have done things on repeat victimization. I think that, um, that uh, people have also used it, uh, this, this group has used it in very creative ways, you know, where they've, they've extended the value of the data by, 
by linking it over time and linking it to other data sets. So, so Eric and, and Min have, have done some work with where they've taken aerial data from the census and, uh, and, and uh, attached to the survey and been able to speak to immigration and other issues that uh, wouldn't be able to be done without that creative linkage. Uh, Lynn has used the structured, uh, sort of uh, structured the, the narratives that the interviewers collect, which is another fairly unique feature of this survey. And so th this group is distinctive, I think, because it has brought these, these data to bear on, um, brought to bear on some important substantive issues, but they've also made very creative use of the unique uh, features of the survey. And so that's, we're hoping that this will give other people ideas about not only how to use the data for its, its obvious purposes, but also how to use these data uh, in very creative ways that were not initially intended. So um, I'm thrilled to get this group all in one place, even if we can't uh, be in person. So uh, uh, this is, uh, I'm looking forward to this. I think um, before we, we get into the panel, uh, I'd like to say something that this is, uh, we have to have a disclaimer that this is not a BJS function. Uh, so this is, this is a labor of love. We just, uh, you know, that, I explained to you why we got interested in it, why we pulled you all together. Uh, this is not a BJS event. So any, anything that these crazy people say is not BJS policy. So we should be clear about that. The only thing that would be BJS statements are those that are authorized and made by BJS. And so I wanted, They've been, they've been very helpful in putting this together, especially in uh, the second session and, and the third session. Uh, they've been very helpful. And I want to I want to acknowledge that, and I want to hold them harmless for every any crazy comments that that we make during the course of this event. So, um, I think without further ado, we should probably go to the introduction of the, of the panel members. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Yes, uh, I also would like to thank um, the support of the BJS, but we do have to make it clear that this, all the statements made today um, is not the official policy of the BJS. Um, okay. Now it's the exciting time to meet the panelists. Um, truthfully, I think um, people on this panel need no introduction, but we do um, invite them to say their name and affiliation, and also use one sentence just to say very briefly about their interest in this uh, panel. And their names are listed here alphabetically, and that's how I will um, like invite them to introduce themselves. The first person is Dr. Lynn Andington. Great, thanks, Men. Hi, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to be with you today. My name is Lynn Addington. I am a professor at American University. Actually, I am celebrating 20 years since I defended my dissertation with NCBS data. So, um, <laughs> and uh, and I've actually been working with NCBS data once I saw about it for almost 25 years. So this is kind of my, I, I don't have children. So this is, so the NCBS is like my <laughs> child. So, <laughs> so I, I look forward to being with everyone today. Thank you. And Eric Baumer. Yeah, hi, thanks. It's great to see so many people here. I. I, uh, I'm a professor of sociology and criminology at Penn State University. Um, my, my main interests are in spatial and temporal variation and behavior. And so the NCVS I learned early on is a, is a pretty cool um, source for that. So I've been involved mainly as an academic researcher and I've also collaborated a little bit with BJS on some preparing some area identified NCVS files. Great. Um, David Cantor. Hello. Uh, Pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I work at uh, Westad. I'm a vice president uh, in the statistical and uh, data science unit. And I'm probably, maybe besides Cohen, I'm probably the most senior person on this panel. I'm probably the only person who's been involved in both of the redesigns of the, uh, <laughs> of the NCBS. Uh, and uh, I've worked with the, with the survey quite a lot, both from a substantive point of view and a and a methodological. So looking forward to the conversation. Okay, next is uh, Lynn Nagenton. Hi, everyone. Thanks for inviting me to be here today. Um, I am a research criminologist at RTI International, uh, but prior to joining RTI, 
I spent about nine years at BJS working on the NCVS and um, as chief of the victimization statistics unit at BJS. So I know firsthand how, how valuable and important the survey is. And, you know, this is a great group of panelists. So I'm really interested to hear all of the ideas today. Uh, next, Janet Lawrenson. Hi, I'm Janet Lauritsen. I'm a professor at the University of Missouri in St. Louis. Um, I've used the data both as an academic researcher starting about 25 years ago um, when um, I was first able to access information that allowed spatial linkages, linkage to spatial data with, with the NCBS. And I've also done some work with BJS on other topics. Um, related to victimization and methodology and measurement. I'm very excited to be here. I want to encourage many people to um, use the data. Thank you. Um, Colin Lofton. Hello, everyone. Uh, I know I pronounce it Colin, not Colin, <laughs> but, but uh, that's uh, because I was named after somebody who pronounced it Colin. Uh, I'm a professor in the School of Criminal Justice at the University of Albany. And I also work with colleagues in the Violence Research Group. I've been a cheerleader for the National Crime Victimization Survey for a long time. And it started, I, I won't tell you how long, <laughs> but D David's right, I probably have been around uh, the survey uh, longer than most of the group. Uh, but I attended a workshop where the instructors were uh, people like Al Reese and Al Bitterman, and they uh, inspired me to uh, get involved in uh, the National Crime Victimization Survey. So I've been doing it ever since. Thank you. Uh, Mike Planty. Hey, everyone. Nice to be here. Uh, great to see all these faces I haven't seen in, in a few years. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Mike Planning, I'm a center director at RTI International in the Applied Justice Research Center. I'm also a former BJSer, uh, statistician, uh, first job out of graduate school. Uh, I, I was introduced to the NCUS uh, with Jim Lynch uh, at American University and have been using it for 25 years to study all kinds of different uh, problems and uh, use it for, um, uh, you know, looking at a whole bunch of different social issues. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Mahi Tesanoni. Hey, Mahi, are you there? Yeah, I saw her earlier. Um, hopefully she will circle back. And uh, um, Jian Hua Xu. Um, thank you, uh, Mia, for inviting me. I've been thinking of why I I'm invited for this panel. Probably I'm the only one who have never uh, used the uh, NCBS data. <laughs> um, basically, I'm a, a qualitative research uh, scholar. Um, uh, my name is Jianhua. I'm from Macau University. I'm part of China. Um, uh, I have been using, I mean, I'm interested in how the data uh, is produced rather than, the, rather than use the data itself. So I have done some research about uh, the construction of the crime rate, uh, crime data in China. Uh, so probably that is the only reason I, I can think of why I'm invited to this panel. Thank yeah, you very the, much. Yeah, the panel is interested in victim surveys or all kinds of uh, um, survey methodology. It doesn't have to be narrowly defined as NCBS. So thank you for being here. Uh, just let me quickly make sure, Ma is Mahi back? Oh, sorry, because um, she, she's from the UK and uh, she has been involved in um, the victimization research in um, using the UK data extensively. That's another example of uh, international scholars participating in this very important uh, research area. So hopefully we'll get her back. Um, she, she's on the screen, man. She's just uh, having audio problems. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I yeah. waved to her. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so David, are you suggesting we wait, or I'm not sure? Well, we'll, we'll have uh, Mahi to to um, um, participate in the discussion, so we'll have a chance. All right. Um, all right. So now we're. Uh, 
in the session where we have questions designed for the panelists. And uh, I will read out each question and then each person will have about two minutes and uh, I will police the time and too bad we're, we don't have music to stop people, but uh, um, let's uh, uh, see how this works. So the first question, some of you already addressed it. So there are two questions um, for in this particular question is how did you first get involved in uh, victim searching surveys, either through the graduate school studies, dissertation, ICPSR or through work? And then what was the most um, uh, important or fun substantive issues you investigated with victim survey data? All right, um, again, I'll go through the uh, order here. Is uh, Lynn Addington? Oh, actually, could we reverse it? Because I'm going to go first all the time. And I really, I, I, uh, okay, I'd, like, all right. I, I, I'd like to start after somebody else if we could. Thank okay, you. Okay, sure, uh, Eric, Eric Bauer. Sure, yeah. Well, I, I became, first involved with the NCBS, and that was my first forte into victimization research in general uh, as a second year assistant professor. Um, but I think the, the seeds were planted several years before that. Um, you know, and so one of the early mentors I had was Janet Lauritsen. And so, you know, seeing, I think, uh, somebody um, with such a great research reputation, work with the data, um, and then, you know, care about things like the, the validity and reliability of crime statistics was, was impactful. Um, and then eventually, though, as an assistant professor, you're looking for uh, projects. And uh, so Janet Lawrence and Al Bloomstein and others um, with the National Consortium on Violence Research had negotiated access to the area identified uh, in CVS. And so uh, that was my um, first uh, experience is working with the data. Um, in terms of what was the most important or fun substantive issue, it, it's kind of difficult to say because there are a couple of people on the on the screen here, and I I wouldn't want to disappoint them. But I think uh, probably probably my first experience, you know, because it was such a learning experience, and um, it was challenging, uh, but it really just uh, made me appreciate how rich the data were and are. And so I'll go with that. And that was a study of how community context influences victim crime reporting. So I'll say that was both, you know, and certainly my most meaningful to me at the at the time. Thank you. Uh, yeah. David. Sure. Um, so my my experience with the NCBS starts all the way back in graduate school. I was working with uh, uh, Ken Land, Larry Cohen, Marcus Felsen when they were developing all their great opportunity theories, and so one day. Uh, Land walks into the room and says, you know, there's this NCBS up at uh, Michigan. Go figure out how to use it. We need it. So, you know, I spent most of my graduate school uh, career uh, figuring it out. And we ended up publishing uh, a number of papers. Um, I co-authored a, a number of papers on opportunity theories, how sociodemographics are related to victim risk using a lot of the work that they had done as well as Hindelang's work, but we sort of applied it in a multivariate framework. Um, and we published three or four papers on that. And of course, I was the research assistant grunt who did all the all those runs for the uh, more well-cited papers by, by those authors. Uh, since then, I've been doing quite a bit of work on the methodology and supporting the development and the methodology of the survey. Um, as I mentioned before, I worked on the, uh, the 92 redesign with Jim, and uh, we published a number of uh, papers and chapters related to how the, how the different survey conditions affect how people report victimization um, and, and issues related to things like panel conditioning, uh, proxy reporting, and those sorts of things. Thank you. Uh, Len Acton? Um, yeah, so I got involved with the NCVS through my employment at BJS. Um, I did not have a lot of exposure to victim surveys in grad school. I focused primarily on uh, white collar crime and corporate crime at that point. And then when I first started working at BJS, I was working primarily on law enforcement and corporate 
after a couple of years at BJS, I, I pretty quickly realized that the NCVS is where the action is. Um, you know, it's really the flag <laughs> survey for BJS. And uh, so I was able to, to make the leap over to work in the NCVS unit. Um, and actually, one of the first things I worked on was the um, identity theft supplement, which was new at that point in time. Um, so that was really exciting to be able to work on that really from the beginning and to help BJS kind of branch into that new area, take the NCBS into a, into a new direction. Um, in terms of the most important substantive issue, I mean, I agree that this is really important, uh, really difficult question um, because there's so many important topics that the survey covers and um, so much important research. Um, but I would say that in terms of importance, I think, you know, one of the areas that I've worked on with the NCVS that, that's up there, at the top of the list is, is hate crime, um, because I would say it's a crime that has such huge impacts, um, not just on victims themselves, but also on their communities. And so understanding the, you know, the level and nature of hate crime is really critical. And this is one area where police data are particularly bad. Um, you have the you have the hidden figure of crime due to victims not reporting to the police, but even when victims are reporting, often you know the police aren't classifying incidents as hate crimes for a variety of reasons. Um, so we know we don't have good data on the law enforcement side on hate crime, and so the NCBS is is really important for shedding light on that topic. Um, so I would put that at the top. And then if I can just say one more that I think is more on the fun side, not that crime is ever really fun, um, but another really exciting thing, a fun thing that I worked on was uh, developing a supplement to measure financial fraud um, with the NCBS. And I think that was really interesting and exciting because um, there's just this perception that there's so much fraud out there. Um, but the truth is what we learned in the development of that supplement is that, you know, the term fraud is thrown around a lot to describe a lot of things that, you know, are bad business practices or, you know, a case of under cheesed pizza. Um, and when you, when you really strip away and get down to the nuts and bolts of what is actually fraud, uh, we found that, you know, it wasn't as prevalent as some estimates might lead you to believe. Um, so that's where measurement was really important. Uh, not to say that it's not still a serious crime for, for people who experience it, but that was interesting. Thank you. Uh, Jenny? Uh, thanks. So I first became involved in um, victim surveys in graduate school when I was working with uh, Robert Sampson on the British crime survey data. Um, and I then um, became involved uh, in other forms of uh, victim survey research through a postdoc that I had with NIJ and with Samson and Laub on um, using uh, youth surveys to measure victimization. It wasn't until 95 or had been actually tenured that I was able to uh, start working with the NCBS. And as Eric mentioned, that was because we were part of a consortium in which we were allowed access to um, the census confidential files known as the area identified so that we could separate the um, contribution of contextual factors versus sociodemographic individual and household factors on risk. So I think that was the most important thing that I did. I became like Eric hooked on um, the capacity of the data and uh, it was overwhelming and it seemed like a real challenge. I learned a lot from everyone who worked with me on that, including Eric, but also um, Colin Loft and Brian Wiersma were there and um, provided much valuable advice. Um, it, it was not a fast process. It was a very challenging process because we couldn't work with it on our own computers. We had to fly to Pittsburgh to do that. So uh, it, was, it required a... a a unique uh, set of time management skills and <laughs> planning. Um, I think that was probably the most important thing because uh, it made me appreciate um, uh, the methodological history and development and the, and, and the ways in which um, national survey data were created. So I became then very interested in the methodological history of the survey and uh, recognized through a fellowship with BJS that they had at BJS more interesting work 
buried in their file cabinets and I had been reading recently the journals. Um, so I was um, um, much appreciative of their um, um, open uh, discussions of all these issues. And I appreciate the time that they gave me to learn all that stuff. And so I would say that was my most important because from then on, I've been with the data. Thank you. Uh, Colin Lofton. Hey, I already told you how I got involved originally. So I'll cut quickly to uh, an interesting project. This is something that I did with my colleagues in the violence research group, David McDowell and Brian Wiersma. It's on the defensive use of guns and victimization. And the, the context is that the existing estimates of how prevalent the use of a gun was in defending oneself in a crime victimization situation were based on whatever data was available and they frequently were poorly worded surveys with not very good samples. And we realized that the National Crime Victimization Survey was ideal for estimating these kinds of incidents. So we used the National Crime Victimization Survey to determine how many cases where a person used a gun. There, there are a number of items on defense, but one of them involves the use of a gun. And because they're related to a specific incident, they're ideal because the other estimates tended to say things like, have you ever used a gun to defend yourself? And that's open to all kinds of interpretations. So if you uh, carry a gun in your car to protect yourself, but you never use it, that's still using a gun to protect yourself. But the crime survey links it to a specific incident and said, okay, did you use a gun in this particular incident? So we, uh, we uh, use the crime survey to do those national estimates. And it turned out that they are about a fourth of the size of the estimates based on the more general question. And uh, it turns out that they're, they're very small, less than uh, a tenth of a percent of cases, depending on whether you're talking about violent victimization or victimization in, in general. But anyhow, that's probably the most interesting thing I've done with the survey. Thank you. Uh, Mike Planty. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, like I said, I, I started in graduate school with Jim Lynch, and he introduced me to the NCS and the NCVS uh, through hours of late night uh, coding um, that were uh, uh, really fun. But I, I think two two streams of um, research that Jim was working on and that I, I think are still relevant today. One was comparing crime uh, police uh, based administrative uh, records to the victim survey to try to make sense of why these things might diverge and uh, how they could complement one another. And as we move into the NIBRS era, right, um, this is gonna be even more important to try to assemble because we, we have so few measures of crime for the nation and to, to, to see these as competing rather as in complementary, I think is something that still, uh, um, you know, a, a big conversation to have to, today. Uh, but I think uh, one of the real interesting um, lines of research was around repeat victimization. Uh, the, the same pattern we see throughout crime is that a, a small portion of victims can account for disproportionate amount of the overall crime rate and trying to understand uh, those victims presenting both technical and substantive issues that re remain today. Uh, the quintessential um, measurement of a crime, right? Uh, somebody comes up to you, punches you, then walks away. Um, and these discrete events uh, don't fit uh, for repeat victims often, uh, domestic violence, where does the threat, where does the uh, um, violence begin and where does it end? And so it, it presents both methodological and, um, and, and substantive issues that were really challenging, interesting, and uh, I think really important to um, work out. Um, and I think today, even uh, when we think about uh, the, um, this notion of high flyers and people revisiting police, calling the police multiple times, or using victim services over and over and to really try to understand that problem. Well, there's so few data systems that you can leverage to understand that. And the NCVS is one that's primed for those questions. Police data are often heavily focused on the offender, less so on the victim. And so um, it, it's often a challenge or impossible to use those data to answer these really important questions around victimization risk and repeat victimization. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Mahi Trisaloni. Hello, uh, can you hear me or see me? 
yeah we can yeah. hear you Oh, brilliant. Thank you. All right. Uh, right. Apologies. Um, you know, three computers later, here I am, really excited and thrilled to uh, joining this uh, forum. Uh, just to uh, back a bit, I'm Mahi Celoni. I'm Professor of Quantitative Criminology at uh, Trent University for the last, I don't know, uh, 15 years. Um, I had a spell at the University of Maryland and I'm very uh, well acquainted with uh, the work of all people and know most of the people in the forum. So thank you so much. Um, I started being involved with the uh, crime surveys back in 1990 when I did my PhD because I was uh, an economist aspiring to do more than solving integral equations saying what you do something social, uh, socially relevant uh, with my econometric statistics skills and uh, there it came the British Crime Survey back then. And then in 1996, uh, I joined uh, Professor Jim Links at the ICPSR uh, summer school uh, at the um, University of uh, Michigan. Um, uh, and that's how I got acquainted with the NCVS and then got a small um, American Statistics Association grant to um, use NCVS to study uh, repeat victimization. Um, so what was the most important of that issue? Uh, it's repeat victimization, uh, but it's also all the contextual uh, factors. So um, in my PhD, um, I looked at crime counts rather than the victim, non-victim uh, dichotomy, um, and I use specific modeling for that. And then uh, via uh, the crime counts then um, came acquainted with crime concentration on particular uh, population uh, subgroups uh, and therefore then looked uh, what can be done to protect them um, and so I um, examined uh, various uh, crime ties but um, like just before the lockdowns actually uh, I got awarded the Australian Statistics uh, Research Excellence um, Award for my work in um, uh, which security devices uh, protect whom and in what context. So I use the features, the, the very rich contextual information uh, that a victim surveys uh, offer, uh, as well as more truthful uh, counting of uh, crime in a society uh, to uh, look um, who who is lacking um, and how um, how so over time uh, effective security um, against the burglary. Um, and many more things, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, Jianhua Xu. Um, and thank you. I think um, it's great to see like uh, NCBS has, has been there for almost 50 years. Um, but uh, for Chinese criminology, we don't have uh, such luck uh, to use the uh, similar data. We don't have any national level uh, crime victim survey data. Uh, we only have official crime statis statistics. But we all know that the official data are always socially produced. There are various reasons to produce that data. Uh, so sometimes it's very hard to believe how accurate that data is. So I started a project around 15 years ago in Guangzhou to look at the one specific city and the trend of crime pattern, crime trend. And the official statistics shows the data has been, the official crime data has been declining for over 60% in 10, in 10 years. So I feel very excited. I try, I try to start to look at what make uh, like the city so safe. And, and, and then start to look at whether China has been following the global uh, crime decline trend. And, but then I started to look at whether we have alternative data to show, uh, to check the, whether official data are accurate or not. So, since we don't have uh, the national level uh, survey data, and then, but uh, very fortunately, uh, I find a uh, uh, local level, city level crime victim survey data, and uh, very luckily. But, but the, the two data shows exactly the opposite uh, trend. I mean, the official data has been declined for over 60%, but the victim, victim survey data shows that the crime trend has been increased for 60%. So that would make me very excited to like look, to look at what are the reasons which make a, such a huge uh, disparity between two so, two source of data. But that is the beginning of my interest in crime victim survey data. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lynn Anderton. Yeah, thanks, man. 
Um, so I guess my experience and my start with the NCBS really was in grad school. So two classes were pivotal. And um, I think you're going to see the kind of family tree <laughs> of people and their use of the crime survey. So one class that was pivotal was with Colin Lofton, um, my, my wonderful mentor and my dissertation advisor. But I first um, worked with him in his measurement of crime class and for him to show all of us about you know, both the UCR data and also NCBS and the potential of all these data. It was, it was eye-opening. It was such a, it was such a um, important class that I took in, in grad school that's kind of started me on this journey. And the other, I, I'll give a shout out to Alan Lazat um, and part of his legacy is the students that he touched and with his research design class that required all of us to use a secondary data source. And so I selected the, actually the, the school crime supplement of the NCBS. So my entry to NCBS was really with the supplements that they have. So I would encourage people who are kind of looking at NCBS and kind of getting their toe in the water. Sometimes the supplements are kind of a helpful way to, to kind of contextualize some of the, um, the work there and also the specific questions that you might be interested in. So that really led me into a deep dive into the, um, the survey questions and what they covered. And again, I encourage people who are getting used to or getting into the NCBS to really study those instruments because through understanding both the questions that were asked and the structure of them, that led me to my dissertation, which actually was a quasi experiment um, looking at students' fear of crime pre and post Columbine. Because I, I, through kind of just getting into the survey, I realized the questions that they were asked and also understanding how the survey was um, implemented in the field with the rotating panel design, it created this, this, um, this really unique opportunity that I had to, to do my dissertation. And so, you know, it, it was, uh, it really kind of got me started with a lot of work using NCBS, especially with the school crime supplement. So I had a lot of other papers that came out of uh, looking at that, uh, changes in school security over time in response to Columbine and other um, mass school shootings. I even collaborated with a colleague in Israel. So we created um, and kind of a nod to our colleagues on the panel who are doing international work and comparative work, which I think is so important. And I actually worked with a colleague in Israel to develop a, a, a school crime supplement uh, type of survey. So we were able to compare student experiences in um, Israel and in the United States. So there's a lot of uh, wonderful opportunities that you can do with the data, both in the United States and also with the comparative context. So I think that that's really, really awesome. My most, I'll, I'll kind of put this as a, kind of a little twist on that question, most important, most fun. I'd say it's my next project, whatever that project's going to be, because there's just so much um, opportunity with the NCDS. There's so many interesting questions that can be asked with it. So I always find like, I finish one project and then there's something else. I'm like, I can, there's a new crime uh, you know, issue that's happening or new crime concern or um, some under or, or a new um, supplement, new supplement data or something like that, that you can really um, utilize those data. And so I think that that to me is one of the, the great things about the, the NCVS is that there's always kind of a new project that's exciting and fun and a lot of opportunity. So that, I'll, I'll end it with that. All right, thank you. Okay, now let's go to the next question. Uh, this question says, did you find the use of the NCVS or another victim survey easy or challenging? And the name, the top two reasons. We'll start um, from Eric Baumer. Well, um, so Jim started off by saying that the purpose is here to get people to use the data source. So I'm supposed to say easy, but I'd say actually the truth is I found it always pretty challenging, but also very, very much worth it. And, and probably also not unusually challenging compared to say other very large complex surveys. Um, so the two reasons I'll mention uh, for why I think it's always been pretty challenging. Um, and I'll mention these as things I think that BGS and others have, uh, uh, I wouldn't say maybe taken care of, but certainly made much easier. So for me early on, um, and for some of the people in here, I think this is true as well. I mean, the early days, you, you, these were hierarchical data structures and, and not really easy to sort of walk in and start using back then. Now, some of the people on the, on the, on this, uh, you know, webinar is going to, would, would laugh at that probably, but um, you know, so that was made, um, that was, that was difficult uh, for, for me at least. And then I think ICPSR and BGS have come together through the NACJD and made that much easier by um, providing incident files, person files and household files and so on. 
along with code to read them, read in the data. Uh, so that's largely been, I think, solved for the public use files. And then um, I guess the second um, issue I'll, I'll highlight is that, you know, much of my work has focused on either piecing together incident level files over different eras of the NCBS. And um, that I found very challenging to do um, based on what was out there. And I was pleased to see that uh, BGS and I think uh, maybe RTI have partnered on um, hopefully making that a lot easier for the people who are here um, looking forward. Um, and then another related thing is that the area identified files that, um, that are available um, really are kind of like raw files. They're like kind of going way back to what the files looked like when, when, when I started. And, uh, and so I'm hoping that, you know, so those were difficult to work with. You know, they're provided by census. They don't have that same kind of processing um, that, that ICPSR does. And so um, there is an infrastructure that's been developed and I'm hoping that that becomes available to, to everybody because I think some of us have worked pretty hard on um, essentially trying to build that infrastructure so that other people could come in and use those data much more readily. And, uh, and so, yeah, so those, that's why I think it's pretty challenging, but I'll just end by saying very, very much worth it, you know, because I think that the NCBS is so unique um, and such a pivotal data set for our country and what we think about crime. So don't let it, don't let it uh, scare you. Thank you. Um, David Kenter? Uh, sure. I mean, Eric's so part of my thunder. I think uh, when I started using the, the NCBS, which was, you know, late 70s, early 80s, uh, they were all hierarchical files. Those were the days where you had to have someone mount a computer tape for you you know, in order to, to look at the data. So if you made a mistake on your code, it it uh, could be two days before you ever could, could redo it. So that was a challenge. And I think at the time, the documentation was not as good as it is now. I think BJS and Census have made the, and ICPSR have made the files much more accessible to people and learning how to use it. I think probably still a challenge is to just learn about the structure of the of the NCBS, it is a, as Jim mentioned, a rotating panel design, uh, which can be quite challenging in terms of understanding who's ac who's actually in the sample at any point in time and how to put how to put the files together. So there is some learning curve, but as Eric said, it's well worth uh, learning, and I think it's much easier to learn both with regard to the the documentation, but also. You know, there are a number of workshops now available for people to learn how to use the NCBS, which I think uh, having been part of those workshops, I think Col Colin was running those in the early days. I think uh, there were a lot of people coming out of those workshops that ended up with, who are now tenured professors. So, um, and they made their name using the NCBS. So I think it, it's certainly well worth using. Um, I think another point that is important to, to consider is just some of the uh, some of how some of the design um, idiosyncrasies of the NCBS might affect your analyses. So, you know, a big one is whether the interview is bounded or not. So in the NCBS, uh, if someone uh, moves into the panel, into a housing unit in the middle of the panel, they get interviewed about the last six months, but their last interview doesn't exist because they weren't there at the time. So it's an unbounded interview. And a lot of the research on the NCBS has shown that those tend to produce much higher rates of victimization. So there are little things like, little or big things, depending on what you're doing, like that related to the NCBS that uh, you have to become familiar with and make sure that you're uh, accounting for these in whatever analysis that you're doing. Thank you. Uh, Lenagna? Certainly feel grateful to have come up working with the NCVS at the point I did um, when we had the, you know, separate files and, and that can be intimidating. I mean, I think that it is intimidating. Um, but like anything, you know, and I don't want to be redundant with what David and Eric have already said. I mean, there's certainly a learning curve and, um, you know, that process of really getting familiar with the structure of the files, but to, to just be a little bit more I don't know, um, optimistic or encouraging. I think, you know, one thing about the NCVS is that, you know, once you understand the structure uh, within each of the files, the, the person file, the household file, the incident file, 
the way the variables are named and labeled is really logical and, and I think pretty easy to, to follow and understand once you are familiar with that structure. And then I think the other nice thing about the NCVS that makes it easy to use is that there's consistency from one year to the next in terms of how variables are named, how the values are coded. Um, so you're going to see the same values being used to identify missing values, for example, the same numeric value being used to identify where something's missing or there was a skip pattern. And so from that perspective, I think um, it there's a learning curve, but once you learn it, it, it's really easy to use in terms of how clean the data are and how well structured and logical they are. Um, and I, you know, the documentation has definitely improved over the years. I think the, this has sort of been referenced, but, you know, BJS is much more or has been much more willing to make their recodes that they use in-house available for researchers to use so that you don't have to figure out how all of the different um, incident questions get you to a particular crime type. That code has already been created. And so if you can get your hands on that code too, and you have those recodes already available to really understand what the different components are that are going into each of the type of crime measures, for example. I think that's really helpful for learning and it also makes life a lot easier. So um, I would say intimidating, but, but logical once you get in there. Thank you. Uh, Jenna Lawrenson. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I would agree with everything that's been said. I'm going to bridge those eras of NCS and NCVS. And I think one of the things, I'll try to say something a little bit different. One of the things that for students and graduate students I've found in users is that um, related to file setup, you really have to think carefully about what your research question is and your purpose is before you go ahead and start creating the file structure to answer that question. Because um, sometimes you can use the pre-made files if you're studying, for example, incidents or you're trying to do rates. But other times you will need to um, be careful that you know, you know whether or not you're asking a question about what affects the outcome of a particular incident. Uh, in that case, you would need an incident file or what affects household risk. In that case, you would need a person level file or a um, household level file, vice versa. So the, you have to think carefully before you get started. What is it that you want to learn? Um, and then begin to um, realize that, um, you know, to how that structure should be created. So that, that would be um, one of the challenging things, I think. It's, this is not a data set you just download and like, uh, or, nor is it a data set where you can just create it for your own purpose and people say, oh, can I, uh, can I use your data? It's like, well, if <laughs> you don't know what I've done to the data, you, 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 don't, um, you won't understand how to use the data file that I'm using to answer a particular research question. So I think that, um, and that um, makes it challenging, but once you get started, then you, there is a path that's easier to manage now than there used to be in the past. Uh, another uh, follow-up on some of the comments made, I, I agree that the NCBS component is easier to use because of the consistency in the um, variable measures over time and um, the availability of things like standard error correction codes and, and PSU, pseudo PSU information for standard errors. But one of the things that is more challenging in the work I've been doing is the historical work going back to 73. It is not easy to work with the files from the 1970, but once you get them set up, it's okay. And there are things that have changed over time um, and you need to double check that for any given year, for example, um, for some big issues like the measurement of race and ethnicity in the United States changes uh, almost decennially uh, following the decennial census. So you will have to write code that be able, allows you to link that, it's become much more complex now than it was, for example, 10 years ago. Uh, so whatever it is you do, if you're working with historical files and trying to add just one more year of data, you need to really look at that new year of data to see if anything changed before I assumed that nothing did. Uh, so that's the biggest challenges, but there, uh, once, like everybody has suggested, once you make that investment in understanding it, there's so many opportunities uh, and it gets easier. It gets easier over time. Thank you. Uh, Mike Planty. 
Oh yeah, thanks. Yeah, I agree. I, I think the accessibility documentation has improved so much that th those are no longer hindrances, really. Um, I think I would really echo Janet's um, advice. Um, it's really about your research project. You can, you can start with a flat file, like the screener, or like su a supplement. You can move into the incident file, which is just victims, right? And comparing different types of victims. But then it gets more complicated when you want to include non-victims in victims. And then to uh, Eric and Janet's work and others' work in the longitudinal sense, you know, when you start layering in multiple interviews over a three and a half year period of time, that becomes even more complex, not only with the um, technical linking, but the interpretation. And because uh, you have attrition and you have other things happening uh, that David mentioned in terms of unbounding. So I think I think you can, uh, it, it, it's as complex and as difficult as you want it to be, um, but it has to be matched to your research question. Um, the other things that often came up in the past were around variance estimation and weighting. And those are pretty much solved with the software too. It's almost like the Ronco chicken, right? You set it and forget it. Uh, you, what, the, the, the guidance there is uh, you know, pretty much available on Google. There, there's enough examples. So again, I, I don't think those challenges are any longer um, insurmountable or there's not uh, enough guidance out there. So it's really about getting into the data file because it's so massive and understanding whether the information there can really address the research question that you're interested in. Thank you. Colin Lofton? Uh, okay. Uh, I sort of have a, a long-term perspective on this and I can see that the technology has changed tremendously. As David said, we don't have to mount the tape anymore and uh, wait two days before we can uh, correct, it, correct an error. So, but it's remarkable in, in my class, Day before yesterday, uh, I had the students use the, the data tool that BJS has up uh, to analyze data. Now that's, that's fairly simple analysis, but it's, uh, it's really remarkable. Uh, when, uh, when the Laddington was in that class, uh, we couldn't do anything with the, with the data itself, but now I can have them. And it, it gives them an opportunity to sort of see uh, how useful the data are. And, and we, we could do a time series back to, uh, I think it was 93 to 2020 and uh, do graphs and so on. So that's really exciting. And you couldn't think about doing anything like that. So uh, the, the data is easy to use, but it depends on what, what your question is and how, uh, how much you want to get into it. Also, m maybe Mike Planty should uh, give me a tutorial on Taylor series linearization, because I think of that as a headless horseman that lives in Suitland, Maryland somewhere. And uh, so it's a, it's a little challenging to me. Thank you. Uh, Mahi Tessaloni? Yeah, so I agree with um, everything people said, but uh, just because this <clears throat> recording would um, uh, would be um, geared towards graduate students. So, um, you know, coming with, um, you know, graduate school, like masters and undergraduates uh, from economics, where I was using like aggregate data for, you know, whatever number of countries uh, or regions, just the sheer volume of victimization survey data, and especially then CVS, it was like mind blowing. What, half a million cases? Is that possible? Um, and so as a graduate student, that was the first challenging thing. Um, and then the other challenge was um, a filter uh, question. So sometimes you would run frequencies and you have like huge missing values. Oh, what's happening here? Oh yeah, you know, it's, you know, it's answer that follows on from something else. So that's something that graduate students should uh, keep in mind. Um, also multiple answers to the same question. So I remember uh, Pat Mayhew, who is the, you know, the instigator of the risk crime survey, actually traveled from London to provincial north dark city of Manchester on a Saturday morning to like explain to me how the data matches the actual questionnaire. Uh, bless her. Um, and the, the last challenging thing of all uh, crime surveys is the use of weights. And luckily, uh, the Bureau of Justice Statistics and like, likewise, uh, officer have um, 
a lot of documentation. Now, in particular to the NCVS, uh, just to um, add, um, just to explore a bit on the uh, attrition issue that was raised before, uh, that was pretty challenging when I wanted to um, use uh, the different six monthly periods as waves uh, to see how a victimization, say January to uh, June uh, of a year uh, might be related to victimization from July to December. Um, and so issues around respond fatigue or more defect, like going from in person uh, to telephone, etc., uh, would have um, affected attrition. And therefore, I couldn't really examine repeat victimization, effects of repeat victimization from one period to the other, as you would have done with um, repeat offender interviews, for example. Uh, so that's one issue uh, that I've uh, encountered, but with the 1994 data. So I'm not sure whether this has been uh, addressed uh, to date. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Jian uh, Huashi. Jian Hua. Yes, yes. Um, thank you. Um, for the crime victim data I used uh, in Guangzhou, of course, that is very, very helpful for my analysis because it. Uh, provide uh, data translation and to the uh, government official discourse. Uh, that is very helpful. Um, but the problem is because it provides an alternative reality uh, to the official discourse. Uh, but nowadays when the political climate uh, has been changed, that alternative discourse has been suspended. Now there is no uh, victim survey data in Guangzhou anymore. It only existed for around 10 years. So that is a very discouraging uh, information. And so, so my research has been working on how the, um, our perception, our understanding about the crime situation is socially produced. So um, I'm, I'm thinking of doing a competitive study in Guangzhou and Macau, because in, in mainland China, is a, we have political reasons for not producing that data. But in Macau and Hong Kong, there's less political reason but have more administrative reasons. Because nobody have in Macau, for example, in Macau, 20 years ago, there's even no official crime statistics under the Portuguese government. But now uh, the, uh, the uh, Macau SAR government did collect the official data, but they never have come up with the idea of, uh, do, uh, of doing crime victim survey. It's not about political reason, but about um, it's more about the, Managerial about uh, administrative reasons. So I so I'm interested in how the uh, crime data, both official data and crime victim data, are socially produced and under what certain circumstances. And that is I think that is why definitely I think the data itself is very interesting. How about the process of producing that data is also interesting. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lynn Addington. Yeah. So one of the things so to kind of go. Up, you know, because I agree with all the, the, the logistical issues that people have been talking about, but I, I'll mention a couple of things that I think could make it using the NCBS a little easier, which is read up on it. Before you use the data, there's a lot of resources that have like explained the survey, explained the structure, ex, you know, kind of gone through that. So um, I would recommend reading those and also reading the instrument and a few of the other comments about skip patterns, about understanding how those data are structured, why you might find a whole bunch of cases missing. And that's per perfectly legitimate because of how people get asked questions as certain follow-up questions and that sort of thing. So to put that investment of time in, um, and I think that that will help ease the use of the NCBS. But the other challenge that's kind of a, one that I don't think people have really touched on, but kind of maybe touched around, is the, um, the fact that it is a secondary data source. And to kind of paraphrase the line of you gotta love the data you got, you know, you can't, that, that, those, that that's what you got. And sometimes, you know, it might make measuring things a little bit awkward, but you, you get the benefit of having, um, you know, a nationally representative survey. You get the benefit of years and years of data. You get the benefit of all the investment in, of research and design that BJS and um, has done with this survey over such a long period of time. So sometimes I think it's easy for people to poo-poo the NCVS or like reviewers or, oh, well, it doesn't ask this or that. You know what, that you, you gotta balance it out because there are very few researchers that could conduct a survey at the, at the scale of the NCVS 
to do this research. So, so sometimes that is a challenge with the data, but um, it's, it's something you kind of have to, to work around, but knowing the survey and knowing the, the instrument and that sort of thing, that gives you, I think, the leverage to kind of be a little bit creative with the data and to get around some of those challenges. But it, that is, it's, it's an issue with all secondary data sources, but that's one that sometimes I do confront with reviewers or people who, when you're doing a presentation and they want to take an easy, you know, kind of shot at you, but, um, but there's so many other benefits of the NCDS and, and then also knowing the survey really well helps you kind of counteract those challenges um, as well. Thank you. All right, so the next question is, uh, um, what's the most exciting or unique aspect of the NCDS or another uh, victim survey for research purposes? Um, we'll start um, from Eric Baumer. To make it more exciting for the others, how about I defer to one of the other panelists that way, Lynn doesn't have to go last again. <laughs> <laughs> so Min, I'll let you choose, but maybe we just um, skip me or. Oh, okay. sure. You mean, you, should I go to David Cantor? Sure, you can come to me. <clears throat> um, I mean, I, I think probably the most exciting thing about the NCBS is just the basic sample size and repetition of the survey. So the sample size alone is a big benefit for looking at things related in, in criminology because a lot of, a lot of surveys aren't, don't have the sample sizes to pick up things that don't happen very often. So um, look, you know, a recent addition to the NCBS, for example, they just added a gender identity question that's now being asked of most of the respondents. And so looking at uh, gender issues related to gender identity is extremely important, but it's not a, a characteristic in the population that is very common. I mean, I think it's probably somewhere somewhere in the one to one to two percent range. So if you want to do analysis of risk related to that population, uh, the NCBS is some is a is a resource that you can use and you can accumulate things over over time. So I don't know what the current sample size looks like these days, but I mean you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people over a, no, a number of years that you can accumulate and look at things like victimization, uh, uh, especially predatory victimization. And BGS has put out a number of reports that have looked at things like workplace violence, domestic violence, police response to serious violence, um, self-protective measures, as Colin uh, mentioned, um, rape and sexual assault. These are all issues that can be looked at with the NCBS that almost no other data set can really do with any kind of statistical reliability, especially with respect to the integrity of the sample of the NCBS. So I think that's probably, if you're asking for one reason, there's many reasons, but if you're asking for one reason, I think that's probably the most exciting. Thank you. Uh, Lynn Nagenton? Yeah, so I mean, just building on what David said, I mean, it, it really is, I think, the, the breadth and depth of topics that you can cover with the survey, um, not just because of the sample size, which is obviously something in the longitudinal nature, but really just, and we've touched on this as we've been talking, but the, the detailed nature of the incident data that are collected, um, there's, there's almost endless possibilities in terms of research questions that someone can, can dig into and start to explore. And, and we've been talking a lot about, you know, questions that require you using the area identified files or linking with other data files or using, you know, exploiting the long longitudinal nature, linking people across time. But I think even just at a basic level, just using the files as they are, there are so many research questions that can be answered. And I think, you know, one example that always kind of stands out for me was when I was just brand new using the NCVS and the NCVS unit, as I mentioned, I started with identity theft. But then one of the first things that I uh, produced a report on was came out of a conversation that I was having outside of work, um, talking about gun control and talking about how, you know, even uh, firearms that are that are legally owned and purchased can end up in the hands of people who shouldn't have them. 
and not being that familiar with the NCVS, I thought, huh, I wonder if I can learn anything from the NCVS about, um, you know, firearms being stolen. And of course, that is data that is contained in the NCVS. And so you can look at trends and patterns in firearms being stolen during burglaries or motor vehicle thefts and put out an estimate of, you know, an, a, a, the number, the magnitude of firearms that are stolen every year. And so that was just kind of a question that came up in the course of a, of a conversation. And, you know, of course, look at the survey instrument and yeah, that's, that's there and it's available. And so um, I think just, you know, that the detailed nature of the incident form, just spending some time with it and really seeing how many different questions are asked about the nature of the incident and the victim response. I mean, the victim response is obviously a hugely, the victim perspective is, is the, the obvious unique aspect of this too, um, that, that you can, can really understand from a victim's perspective um, what their experience was, the, the harms that they experienced um, and, and how they reacted in terms of what type of services they sought or didn't seek. Um, there's a lot more that BJS can, can do in that area and I think is, and we can talk about that a little bit more, but that's another big piece too. Thank you. Uh, Jenna Lawrenson. Yeah, like uh, as has already been said, I mean, the, it's the sheer power of the data, the sheer statistical power of the data that makes it wholly unique and its consistent nature over time. So for me, what I think is most exciting about it now is, it's, is the capacity of the data to study changes over time. A lot of times in research, uh, we read an article that might be five or 10 years old and or maybe 20 or 30 years old since somebody looked at the topic last and we wonder, uh, if we restudy the issue now, will we find the same results? Um, well, you can check it out with the NCBS over time if you make a commitment to those data. Um, one of the things that I've uh, been able to work on with colleagues, in, in addition to Eric, but um, work with him, but um, oh, we've looked at, for example, uh, differences in the gap over time between males and females risk for victimization over almost a four, past 45 years now, um, where we find changes over time. We've also looked at race and ethnic differences over time and found a persistent significance of race, uh, black white differences, but not in the case of Latino and um, versus white differences. So there is no other data in the world that would allow you to do that. Um, that that's pretty, pretty much makes it unique. Um, and to, to be able to do it with uh, comparatively small population groups um, also makes it unique. You might have to make some adjustments after studying the data, whether you need to use rolling averages or pooling the data somehow, but it, it does have the capacity for you to uh, not abandon the topic and say, oh, there's just not enough power, but to say, okay, what if I roll, it, roll up some years and look at things uh, in groups over time? So, I think that's the most, to me right now, the most uh, exciting aspect of it. Thank you. Uh, Colin Lofton? I'll try not to be redundant uh, in things I say, but one of the things that's always been useful to me, and you can see that in, in what I was talking about before, is that the crime survey is about things that actually happen. It documents a specific incident and a lot of surveys just ask general questions about attitudes, which are, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that kind of research, but it's a real advantage that you're, you're documenting specific incidents uh, and facts and the sample size uh, contributes to that. But also an awful lot of work has gone into framing questions that are methodologically sound and we can take advantage of, of the fact that that's been done uh, the other thing is that the, the Bureau of Justice Statistics is working on subnational estimates. Uh, and that's very viable. Uh, I think that work is still in, in progress. There's been some, uh, some data uh, been made available for uh, much positive areas, but that makes it possible to, uh, to link the crime survey data with other, other sources. And uh, that makes it, really attractive to people who are doing research because they want to make causal inferences rather than to just describe the, 
the population description doesn't get enough uh, merit in our field. Uh, description is very, very important. If we don't know the patterns of crime, it's hard to explain it. But nevertheless, there's a uh, uh, maybe it's a fashion that people focus on causal inference and the area, area uh, small area estimates make that a lot easier. And that's important. Thank you. Uh, Mike Planty? Mike had a leave. I think he oh. sent it in the chat. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Uh, Mahi Tessaloni? Yeah, so um, I would agree uh, with what people said. I'm just going to repeat. So in general, um, national crime surveys of the quality um, and longevity of the NCVS and the crime survey for England and Wales um, have the advantage of uh, consistency uh, of their uh, crime measurements. And I was told, I'm not going to say by who, uh, that uh, the NCVS was actually launched because the state did not trust uh, their police uh, recorded crime. Um, and similarly, the crime survey for England and Wales is the only uh, reliable source of measuring crime uh, in England and Wales. Uh, the police recorded crime was the designated national data uh, status uh, just after a year uh, it, it was named uh, because police recorded crime uh, at the end of the day is simply administrative data of the work uh, of the police, uh, but it's not um, a, a measurement of uh, the crime in the society. So. Consistency is a big aspect and also consistency in basic uh, characteristics, factual information uh, about the incidents and characteristics and attributes of uh, people affected uh, by uh, these crime incidents. But also crime is, um, is a sociological construct, right? It's, uh, it changes. With the society, it's different things in, in different societies, different things in different uh, periods of time. So at the same time, that's consistent. A uh, crime survey has the benefits of being adaptable. For example, Pat Mayhew again had said, oh, we managed to increase domestic violence in the country. This is because there were questions about it and therefore it was highlighted as an issue. Uh, hate crime uh, nowadays um, is more important or a coercive uh, control, which is a part of domestic violence that actually has no uh, bruising and kicking. It's, it's emotional violence. So all these aspects of crime um, are now unacceptable to uh, the society, but they weren't 10 years ago. And the and crime service can measure this and can record this. Uh, so these are two um, major benefits. The other benefits, and I would uh, um, agree with previous with NCVS is the volume. So that allows for conditioning of effects. Um, if you want to do a um, random random coefficients modeling, so you can see that something. Uh, you know, it holds in certain settings, but doesn't hold in other settings, for example. Um, and nowadays, what's really beautiful is the fact that you can link a uh, crime survey uh, data sets uh, with other sources. Uh, Janet and Eric and other people uh, in the panel have linked with the census data. Uh, you could, um, the Crime Safe in Wales collects information about self-report offending. So you could from now on link it uh, with uh, administrative uh, justice data. And sorry, I forgot to mention, I'm also academic lead of the Data Fast Project of Minister uh, of Justice here in, in the UK. Uh, and what's unique about the NCVS, the unique benefit is that um, it interviews all members of the housing unit. And that's really important. That's only unique in the NCVS as well as the longitudinal aspect. Um, and in my view, um, you know, this always more than can be done, uh, especially as, again, we change uh, perceptions of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jianhua. Um, thank you. Um, the data I used, of course, I found it very interesting, although it only uh, existed for 10 years, but not anymore. But I think it was, uh, what is more, more interesting is about uh, how the agency who used to collect data transformed its duty 
in, in the past, they uh, collect data about the crime victim uh, uh, victim survey, but now they uh, still collect data, but it's more about uh, the opinion, people's fear of crime. So they totally changed the survey items from more um, uh, objective items to very subjective items. I think that is uh, uh, very exciting for me to understand how the, our perception, our understanding about uh, our society has been changed and also kind of produced or manipulated by various reasons. I think that is fun. I find it's, um, it's most exciting uh, for that kind of research. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Lynn, anything? I guess I'll just, you know, obviously highlight a lot, you can <laughs> agree with a lot of what's been said. And I also want to highlight um, the point that Lynn Langton made about um, really being able to be creative with the data. And there's a lot of things that you, you kind of like, she had the conversation with a, with a friend outside of work about like, you know, um, about uh, stolen guns and, and that issue. I often you know, watch the news or what, you know, read something and go like, well, is that really right? And, and that leads me to, to oftentimes that's something that you can be studied with the, with the NCBS included. That was kind of like the prompt with my dissertation was that, that you know, right after Columbine, everyone, all the news media, the students are terrified. Nobody wants to go to school, all these. Things. And then my question was like, is that true? And so you're able to use um, these data to explore questions that are current, that people want to know the answers to. If you're curious about it, there's probably a lot of other people who are curious about it. And uh, knowing the, the NCBS and all the issues it covers and the topics and that sort of thing, you can really um, drill down and, and explore some of these things. So uh, again, kind of just agreeing with, um, with Lynn, Lynn's point about how you can be really creative with the with the data set once you once you get to know it and invest that time in it. So I, I would say that that's um, a really great aspect of the NCBS. Thank you. Uh, Eric Bummer. Yeah, well, uh, I wish I hadn't passed now, but um, no, I, I actually, I, I, I agree that I think that we're coming up on almost 50 years of data. And so the temporal, uh, even though there've been some important shifts over time, the capacity for social studying social change, I think that's probably most unique, but not just long-term change and not just in crime, but also in crime reporting and the nature of crime. I mean, like who's involved, what happened in the incident. I think that there's a lot of untapped uh, potential there, um, both long-term and also short-term. Sometimes we have these massive changes like a pandemic or, you know, you can think of a lot of different uh, things um, that occur and it, it just becomes very interesting to kind of look at, well, what, what impact may have those things had on the nature of crime or crime reporting or, or victimization risk. And so I think that that's what I think is most unique because I can't really imagine another source of data that can allow for that. I mean, we know that, uh, for example, the UCR has some, some limitations there because of growth in police agencies, changes in uh, citizen reporting and whatnot. Um, and I'm, I think those issues are exciting, but I actually will mention one more that I don't think has been um, uh, maybe kind of touched on a little bit, but I think the most exciting um, opportunity, um, and I'll call it the potential, uh, that's the potential capacity for the NCBS to be used. And I'm talking about the main NCBS, but also the supplements, so, you know, the school supplement comes to mind, especially, uh, to be used to assess criminal justice and social policy uh, impacts. Um, a lot of times policies that we implement in our country, at least, um, are likely to make either people more or less likely to report to the police I think it's safe to say that nearly all of our assessments of policy in this country rely on police data. And I, and I wonder if that's a, a, a smart thing. So to me, um, that's one example of uh, an untapped market that I think would be very exciting to push to see what can be done. It's not gonna be simple, but I think that that, that very much excites me about that data. Thank you. Um, so now we actually are entering the group discussion session because I do wanna make sure we have sufficient time for questions. Um, and so for each, we have two of these questions. Each one will just, you know, make eight minutes. Um, that should uh, give us time for discussion. Um, the first question is, what would you add to or change the NCVS to make it more useful for research purposes? Um, so please feel free to um, um, share your opinion as a panelist. Thank you. Uh, my comment, it's not really about the survey itself, 
my comment is we need more things like this. We need more workshops where uh, people learn from people with experience. Also, videos that are made available online that address how to use the data would be useful. That's not a part of the survey itself, but it's the context. Thank you. Is this the part where anybody can uh, ask questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, people feel feel free. We have a few minutes for this discussion. Just um, yeah. Yourself. So I, I I just want to um, circle back to something uh, Colin Lofton said about uh, the availability of subnational data. You know, I specialize in hate crimes, and invariably, you know, probably over the last two years, I've gotten maybe. 24, 25 inquiries from the media, you know, regarding hate crimes. Hate crimes are very regionally nuanced. The types of hate crimes you're going to get here in New York are primarily anti-Semitic, but those are going to be quite different than the ones you're going to get in Georgia and other places. So my question is, and Jim, this is something I asked you at a conference a couple, you know, some years ago. To what extent are um, data available on a regional basis, let's say like New York, uh, to, 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 to look at some of those, uh, those kind of regionally nuanced uh, indicators of, uh, of hate crimes in terms of reporting injuries and, and that type of thing? I uh, guess I could, uh, oh, go ahead, Jim. Go ahead. No, Janet, you, you go ahead. You, you're, you're better able to answer. I just wanted to mention um, quickly that I did a, a report. It's called a third party report for BJS that just came out this year where we, using the publicly available NCBS data, investigated the degree at which you could do uh, subnational estimates. So that's with the data files that are currently available at ICPSR, what was the capacity of the data? We were able to look at region of the country. We were able to look at the uh, city size in metropolitan areas, and, it, and you can look at metropolitan area level data. Um, but you, we did have to use five years worth of data in that report. And that was a report for violence overall and for serious violence overall. When you asked whether or not those were hate crimes, uh, I do uh, my I do not think the data can support a strong conclusion about that unless you were to try to roll up ten years, which is not the kind of thing media tends to be interested in. They want to know what's going on right now. Um, but I'm but the problem is when you look at subtypes of violence, hate crime or non hate crime, you you further divide the power of the sample to be able to say something uh, strong with a great deal of reliability. So I would say that you can do some of that, um, but if they want to know what's going on right now, the victim survey data are going to be limited in what they can they can uh, provide for media purposes, especially. Frank, I think you, you. I don't want to speak for BJS, but I think they 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 have yet to come. Uh, I think finish their subnational. Um, so that you may have a clearer answer about state level estimates when they um, when they finished their sub -nest. It was sort of interrupted for a while there, but but I think it started again. But again, the BJS guys could, could probably um, give more authoritative information, but, but there may be a big state like New York may, may have the sample that would allow, but it's a rare event, relatively rare event since. Yeah, yeah, no so, doubt. So Janet's caution is, is still applicable. Can I ask another question? Um, I'm sorry, um, I'm not quite, I don't quite remember. Is there um, a more general self-report of funding and drug taking um, and health in the NCVS? There is no self-report of funding measures in the NCVS. Yeah, so I think that would that would be really, really, really helpful because as you have done, Janet, tons of research on the links between victimization offending with the longitudinal um, youth data. Uh, yeah. That would be very helpful uh, to understand 
kind of motivations and needs of um, potential offenders and that would then feed into a policy and policy which is not punitive and you know divisive but more like supporting uh, people with I don't know needs or growing up in difficult environments or with mental health issues etc drug addiction etc so rather than you know reduce reoffending you simply support uh, people with particular health issues and you launch it as a public policy um, initiative rather than um, a justice initiative. I think Jim could probably speak to this, but I agree with your point. I also gave up uh, on that push. I was convinced the concern about what effect a survey sponsored by an agency in the Department of Justice asking about offending, what effect that would have on participation and the rates themselves. And so um, I don't think it's going to ever happen. <laughs> it's a government agency collecting the data, even under, uh, it just would be likely to be very rate even if affecting. you do um like um sep what is it a supplement maybe on an outgoing rotation but uh, that's the, i think even uh, when you do it with the um you know with the kind of the mode where respondents um answer and the interviewer cannot actually see the answers what it's called i forgot self something self-report yeah yeah. yeah. Didn't the didn't the Home Office sponsor an offending survey? No. The, well, the Home Office had the um, offending crime and justice survey. Yeah, uh, it was panel, and so it had attrition. And obviously, you know, crime is a rare event, and um, and so that stopped. The panel was worth from two thousand two two thousand six. It was around two thousand who remained in the entire four year period. Uh, but the crime suffering in Wales has uh, a module on um, self-report uh, drug addiction and alcohol abuse and self-report offending, um, which is, yeah, which is fine, I think. And now I don't know whether you were at the um, um, forum of uh, crime surveys, ONS organized, um, they have been considering um, adding now a panel aspect because during lockdown, they had to rely on a smaller sample. So they turned it into a panel um, and now they're considering retaining this, uh, this mode. Um, but here it is administered by the Office for National Statistics, which is not linked to the Home Office or the Ministry of Justice. It's independent and it is, um, by, it is um, directed by the national statistician and they are you know they can they're free to say whatever they want you know against the government so if you if you go into my more or less link to the interview uh, so it's a national statistician who said you know the prime minister doesn't know his data about crime <laughs> for example um, so they've got the office says it has this independence and therefore um, people would feel better to be truthful um, uh, about their responses. I think um, it, to all the points that you made and Janet made about the concerns of adding these kind of items to the NCVS, I think BJS has looked into this before the victim offender overlap and recognizing that it's hugely important. And one of the considerations, there's a number of inmate surveys um, that BJS conducts. And one of the things that we were exploring at one point in time is adding some victimization questions to the inmate survey and trying to get at the victim offender overlap from that perspective. Um, and so that may be something that BJS picks up again down the road. Um, so asking people who are incarcerated about their victimization experiences is another way to get at that. Yeah, that'd be great, yeah. There are some questions on victimization in the inmate surveys, but they, they aren't very precise. 
Yeah, and not necessarily just what's happening in the facility, which is a lot, you know, like PREA, for example, the Prison Rape Elimination Act, some of those surveys focus on what's happening in the facility, but some of the questions are around what's happened to someone throughout their life course, what types of experience, victimization yeah. experiences yeah. they've had yeah. prior to incarceration too, yeah. Min, I, I was going to just add one thing. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to make any additions or changes that compromise the, you know, the primary purpose of the, of the NCBS and also that undermine BGS in any way. But one thing that I sometimes wished for is kind of a model for the supplemental surveys that was um, kind of a, a, kind of like the general social survey does. Like it's, a, it's an open call to researchers and, um, you know, oftentimes to just add one or two questions or, you know, it could be a couple more, but I understand the cost. You can even pass the cost on to, to whomever's proposing it. But I think that would be kind of cool just because it would um, add a, a capacity to make the, the, at least the vehicle of the NCBS uh, adaptive and responsive to kind of like, you know, things that are happening. And I thought, I think it also, that kind of model could bring in more people. I think I, I love some of the supplements and I, I actually think the process that's been used is really valuable. But I think it, it does take a while and it also um, might, might limit the circle because it really requires many of the people on this, this panel, I think, participate in those. So I, I think that would be kind of neat if, if right. feasible. Yeah. Thank you for the, uh, for the interest of time. Let's go to, oh, sorry. Let's go to the, the other one, which is uh, for scholars who want to use the NCVS survey or just victim surveys in general, what advice do you have for them? We'll, have, we'll do this quickly and then afterwards, then we'll go to the Q&A session. Can I just put a plug into whatever data set you're using, get that code book, read it, love it, read it, Love it. I mean, I, because I, I think there's so many people who jump and I, I review papers. And I'm just like, okay, you just completely because you just grab the data and off you went. Um, but it, it takes investment of time. And I've been, I, yeah, I, I did learn NCDS in the um, in Niverson grad school, but um, yeah, I've picked up, you know, NISVIS and uh, SOX and a few other, um, you know, the, all these great big data sets, but, but you have to really understand them. And, but, and that's an investment of time and it slows you down. And I know what you really want to do is just grab those data and run and, and use them. But I would really recommend that it will, it will save you grief in the long term if you just, if you look at that documentation um, read up on the data set. Other other people have used it. Other, and then there are also just you know wonderful like kind of just encyclopedia articles and that sort of thing that you can just get a better sense of, of the data and what it can do and what it can't do, because there um, there are limitations. Every data set has its limitations, um, but it does which doesn't mean it's it's wrong for your question. And I think I, I'm echoing I think what Janet was talking about and a few others. Where what's your research question and make sure that the data can answer that and, and what's the structure and what's the skip pattern and all those kinds of things because it will save you so much grief going forward to just invest that little bit of time and then you can and then once you have that investment then as others have noted you can just you've got that and you can just explore the data for so many research questions but I would really I can't emphasize that enough put that invest that time in it and it will pay off for you I promise it will pay off for you. Thank you. I think just to add to that, you know, at, at the risk of speaking for others, I think the folks that work at BJS are passionate about the NCBS. You've got a panel of people here, people that have worked on the NCBS for years that are passionate. And so I think the other thing is, you know, put in the time and look at the code book. But then if you have questions or you want to bounce ideas off, I think that there's a, a large pool of people who feel really strongly about the NCBS and encouraging the use of it and uh, would be happy to be used as resources. That's a very good point. I would add, it's not just the code book, it's the questionnaire. You have to go through it and understand how it works. And as David Cantor said, there are a lot of subtleties that uh, you have to understand in order to use the data. Things like uh, who gets the telephone interviews uh, at, uh, at various times at centralized uh, te telephone banks and who gets the centralized telephone interviews and who doesn't is, uh, is not just a random process. So there are things like that that you have to understand to use the data effectively. Yes, if I may, um, 
uh, that was the, the other thing I needed to um, add in the previous question. Um, so I think that for sensitive questions, um, if NCVS could consider the, you know, the funding to um, have all interviews in person. Uh, so I can understand, you know, people can log in, you know, their age, their gender, da 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 da, educational and employment status. But sensitive things like, you know, coercive control, domestic violence, self-report offending, you know, drug addiction, um, even other, you know, potentially embarrassing um, issues like, I don't know, long-term disability, um, if they can have this part of the survey uh, done consistently. Uh, in person, self, uh, I forget again, you know, where basically you turn the iPad to the interviewee and they click in and the interviewer doesn't even know what the answer was. Uh, that makes it more reliable. And then the respondent feels, um, you know, um, confident that their data is not going to be uh, misused. Um, so advice for the scholars, just, uh, just think of it as two things. Um, a long-term investment, because as we can see from the members in this panel, uh, you know, careers have been built on using analyzing crime survey data and long-term investment for the good of your social uh, co-citizens, um, because all aspects uh, studied with NCVS could be turned into um, a policy initiative and improve lives. I think that's 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 the most important uh, reward. I'll add one. Or two the career is good as well. Sorry, <laughs> I'll add two things, man. Uh, one is that you know, listening to people describe how they came to use the data. There's clearly a mentorship model here, an apprenticeship model, and I, I so I would advise people to consider reaching out and seeking that kind of you know um, mentorship. Um, and the the second thing I'll say is that at least. This used to be done. Um, ICPSR, I think Jim, I think you taught uh, maybe a one week class there. And, and so, you know, I think telling people to read the code book is great. I mean, I completely agree with that. Um, at some point, though, I think there's a little bit more that will be required. And, and I thought that was a great model that ICPSR course that was taught, I, I believe, by Jim and maybe others. Um, and so I would just lobby and advocate for that to be brought back in some fashion. I think that was really valuable. Yeah, I believe uh, Jim and uh, Colin and uh, also Len, they all were instructors for, for the ICPSR workshop. I participated as well. Oh, and then one of the things I told them first day of the ICPS work was to do the code book. So that was, and then we worked yeah. with it and worked with the other, other data sets, but that was one of the, the things that we kind of, because most people don't, and, and also the instrument and that sort of thing. So that's just kind of a, the, the, the quick word. Okay, so why agree, don't we? Guys. Yeah, so why don't we I go think to start? was a good community. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think many of us are participants of that workshop. Why don't we go to the questions now? Um, and the Vaili, I, I'm not sure if I could see the chat, but uh, if you don't mind, could you read out some of the questions if we have some, or if you, anyone wants to unmute themselves, ask questions, that will be fine as well. Uh, yeah, in the chat, we have one question. Um, it says, I'm a PhD student. I will begin my dissertation next year. How often is the survey completed? How often? Um, so the, the main survey would be uh, conducted annually. Um, the data would be available in the ICPSR. Uh, depending, on sub, depending on which you use, right? Supplements and the main survey. Um, supplements will be conducted less frequently, um, but the, all the uh, availability of the data would be on the IC, uh, on BGS and ICPSR website. Um, I'm not sure if I addressed the question. Somebody else, please uh, feel free to share information. Yeah, just add that the data are available annually, but they are continuously being collected. They're collected first every month of the year, first two weeks of the month. So that's one of the things that's really important reason why you need to read a, uh, something about the survey before you, before you, I would actually say a little bit before you do that in the questionnaire, then go into the code book for some, some even more the details. Another suggestion I have that's along the lines is I would read, I would recommend for, 
graduate students that they begin reading uh, a review, a, the most recent review of the victimization survey by the National Academy of Sciences. It's available free for download at the National Academy Press. It's nap.edu. It's called Surveying Victims, Options for Conducting the NCVS. And you'll get a quick, not quick, but actually thick, but you'll get a, a review of the history of the survey there, the issues about measurement and um, kind of the goals of the survey so that you can then have a broader perspective, historical perspective on why it is what it is and why it takes the form that it does right now. Thank you, Janet. I believe Jamie Flexum has a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, I have just recently started getting into using the NCBS. I used the Police Public Contact Survey on a previous um, paper. I want to use it again. Um, I have a couple of issues, and maybe you all who have vast experience working with the NCBS can address for me, is I'm, um, I have some issues with how race and ethnicity are being measured and they seem to consolidate this into one measure. And I can't wrap my brain around <laughs> trying to sort out and parcel out the effects of race, how it's currently being measured in the NCBS and kind of conjoined and, and this like almost like a single measure. So I was going to use uh, the police public contact survey for um, another study and I had to abandon it because of how the controls were linked back over to that subset survey and it became um, not useful to me. So then I had gone over to the NCVS and I agree with Lynn. Uh, I went to school with Lynn, <laughs> um, uh, Addington. And um, it is a daunting task to go through the code book and read the extra methodological reports. And, and you get to the end of it like a year later after you're doing everything else as a professor and you're just like, <laughs> can I use this with all the skip patterns and everything that, that comes? So yes, I see that. Um, so first, can you guys discuss the, um, the race uh, variable, race ethnicity, basically what they've done, I see a lot. And two, um, I know there's no shortcuts in life, but what is the biggest thing? I know read the code book, I've read the code book. <laughs> and what is the biggest thing you can parcel out almost like, because I don't intend on writing a dissertation on it and you're trying to get advanced people getting into using the NCBS. What is the one or two things that you can advise um, somebody like me who uses a number of data sets, does a number of different studies, would be the best way to orient themselves to the NCBS? Or is there just no hope that there's a short-term thing? You just have to really, this is going to be your life's goal. <laughs> you know? So I hand it over. Anyone would like to uh, answer the race ethnicity issue? I mean, so the, the NCBS follows the... Um, so the Office of Management and Budget recommendations on how race and ethnicity should be collected in federal surveys. So oftentimes people will combine race and ethnicity into a single variable, but on the, on the file, um, you have the, the, the person's race and ethnicity are collected separately. And so you can get more detailed categories. Now, the question is whether those are actually on the PPCS survey but I think the PPCS is now linked to the full NCVS, is it not? Um, that, that might be something. I'm, I'm happy to look into that a little bit more and, and provide guidance offline. I'm kind of talking on memory. I didn't but see how to do that. I just throwing that out there. I didn't see how to do that. I saw somebody going through great acrobatics doing that in, in another paper and it was kind of iffy to me. So it was not like a straightforward thing to do. Yeah, I believe well, Leanne Slocum from the AMSO uh, wrote a paper about how to link the uh, uh, police public contact survey with the main NCVS survey. Um, yeah, but in the main survey, you definitely get very detailed race ethnicity information, as Lynn just mentioned, um, whether or not linking. Um, I haven't done it myself, but I, I'm looking forward to, to see how the two surveys can be linked together. And Pat? Yes. Can you see me? 
Yes. Um, I Mackie mentioned um, that the Office of National Statistics here had to go through enormous number of, of, of hoops to deal with COVID and they had to change the sample, they had to change the uh, mode of interview. What were the COVID implications for the NCVS, including, for instance, the first in-person interview? And um, allied to that, are there any, uh, any sort of special COVID analyses planned for the ends from the data that came out during the COVID period? That question is perhaps best addressed by BJS people here. I because uh, we recently had the also David can my might my, my provide some information there about the uh, effect of COVID on the NCVS survey. Um, yeah, I, probably best Jenna or um, Heather might be better to, to address. <laughs> I think uh, I think there was some interruption in the in the interviewing because the you know the field studies were not um, going out into the field during certain parts of the COVID, but I'm not exactly sure what, what sorts of analyses they're planning to, to look at the effects. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the, the good news is uh, um, Jenna from the BJS, Jenna Truman, she will have all the information you seek out. So I would recommend uh, if you are really interested in that, you should definitely get in touch with, with BJS um, staff. Um, Jenna Truman uh, would be the person to contact. And if you, uh, Pat, you can send and me they, an email. Yeah, and there is a, a subsection in the, C, the Criminal Victimization 2020 report about some of the analysis they did for the 2020 release. So you get a sense of uh, what the interruption was like and how they did the weighting adjustment for that. Um, but it, it appeared for for 2020, so that would have only covered part of the year and the incidents that occurred that year. It's a 2020 calendar year of data collection. But so there's some about that. I don't know if BJS wants to talk today, but you could start I, that. Could well, I, 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 it's my fault. It's obviously a much more issue for BJS, but more pertinent to this current discussion. Can you think of the top of your head what COVID questions in the future what answers to COVID questions in the future researchers might want to think about? Um, that's a very, do you mean like uh, think about the survey mode in order no, to address? No, no, forget, forget the technicalities. Uh, obviously, you'd have to accommodate any changes that the technical changes introduced. But in terms of patterns of crime, for instance, I mean, it is generally... Um, assumed here, well, I think there's good evidence for it, that crime went down very, very substantially, or some forms of predatory crime went down very substantially. But they, the thinking here is, is that computer crime increased enormously. That's sort of um, a little bit off pat. I think it remains to be seen whether there was it will remain to be seen whether that was act, an actual effect. But it obviously raises all sorts of interesting little avenues for researchers to go down. Anyway, I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, the, the discussion about COVID, for example, like how it has affected domestic violence, right? Um, that's an important issue. Yeah. And also there is this discussion about how uh, minority groups or disadvantaged communities are affected more severely by COVID. Um, yeah. And so this kind of discussion about specific neighborhoods, race, ethnicity, disadvantaged communities, immigrant groups, or these would be uh, important questions to be investigated. Um, and that would require us to have the capability of using the sub area um, data and uh, oh, uh, so I think you are right is on that these questions could be explored uh, or some specific questions added to the, to the NCVS if possible. And uh, BJS is in the process of redesigning the survey. Um, so again, I would say um, if you have important suggestions, get in touch with BJS staff members, those um, things perhaps could be, um, they will seriously consider the suggestions. Min, uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, my my microphone died, so I'm 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 using my phone, which may die as well. But 
Uh, hello, Pat. How are you? It's good to see you. I, I think, uh, but I think it, you may have included this in your comments, but to sort all this stuff out, BJS is going to have to be revealing about any kind of methodological changes that they that they engaged in um, during the COVID situation. And I don't know, I don't know what their plans are for that, but I think it would be crucial to sorting out the the the, the methodological distortions that might occur as well as the the real ones. So I think it would be good to, to have that too. Yeah, we have three minutes left and any other questions or comments from the panelists? Um, um, we did have a couple more questions in the chat. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, hit please more. read them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so this person says, could the panelists expand on the issues of understanding the sample due to the rotating panel design? My research question involves looking at recurrent victimization reported by participants followed across the three-year follow-up period. Um, sir, you mean by increasing the sample? I um, think what, what I would say is that if you're, um, I think I get the gist of the question is that that is one of the most complex issues to use the data to study. You will have to create your own files uh, with uh, each interview and then order them uh, over time. It is not for the <laughs> weak of heart. So uh, I would, if it was me, I've tried, I've done this before with other people and uh, I would, it probably took uh, six months of, of assessing to make sure you did it right. Um, so I would, I would not, and I want to discourage you, but if you're just starting off, I would not really take that big dive yet. I think the 1994 NCBS data set I used for my uh, Boost and Flags paper with Ken Keys, it was linked already by the Bureau of Death Statistics. I don't think I've done the linkage. DJS now has a person in sample, address in sample, household in sample. They sort of give you some information about the longitudinal waves, but it's not linked automatically. So you, you have to create all your own longitudinal data sets. And also not just by linking by ID, you also have to evaluate the accuracy of linking because sometimes, particularly in older data, the IDs may or may not show the same you know, age patterns or race ethnicity patterns or even gender. So, you know, there's something, it's a small percentage, but for the, for the accuracy of data linking, you do have to check those. And features. sometimes you have to be careful when you, they introduce a new sample with the decennial census, because that can like, <laughs> I've had people try to replicate things with different years and it just, it's a, it's a huge mess. So it's, it's a, like Janet said, uh, tread cautiously. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I think Mahi, uh, Mahi's recollection is, is correct. They, the Census Bureau did put together a longitudinal file. Oh, okay. Uh, because, uh, so I think, and Dave may weigh in on this, because I, I think some of the original work that Dave did with Al Reese on, um, um, on, on effects of proxy interviewing, I think, was, was you, used a longitudinal file that Census had cobbled together. So I think that's maybe what Mahi's thinking of. Okay, so we are, that's all the time we have. And I apologize to those with your questions are not get dread, uh, addressed. Please email me. I will be happy to answer um, any questions you may have. And uh, um, just a reminder that we have a session tomorrow and then the session next uh, week. And I really want to thank all the panelists for um, taking the two hours of their busy time to participate and share the experience. And uh, again, um, get in touch with us. And I uh, thank you for all your participation. And hopefully we'll uh, have seen more people use NCBS.